Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> These are, this is one of the most famous lines in history. And this is actually one of the most famously misquoted lines in history because the original phrase is, Houston, we've had a problem. Spoken by the crew aboard the Apollo 13, unfortunately failed mission to the moon. They experienced some quite unexpected system failure, which was meaning a difference in achieving their mission as well as a life or death decision for returning back home. They were communicating with their NASA's mission control. And with this communication, they were able to devise an alternative that would end up saving their lives. So NASA's mission control was helping monitor their trajectory, their life values, their fuel intake, their electrical systems. So it was the brain of the mission. And quite similarly, our brains are able to control, are responsible for, are capable for, of such complex orchestrations as NASA. Now, we're not able to necessarily launch and land lunar shuttles currently, but we are able to control a number of other devices and computer interfaces that are just as important to a certain group of individuals. These folks are living locked into their bodies. So I'm going to have you imagine for just a moment, and fortunately it is just a moment, that you are completely paralyzed. You are unable to speak. You can think. You can hear. You can feel. Sense all that is going on around you. But unfortunately, you do not have a way to proactively interact with that environment. You can't turn to the person next to you and say, oh, how are you enjoying this talk? Or tell your significant other how much you love them without some alternative means. So we look internally to be able to do that. And in this case, now we're looking at hands-free control of our devices. Traditionally, we interface with our computers with some physical input, moving a mouse, typing on a keyboard, or even swiping with your finger. But all of this is requiring some voluntarily, voluntary muscular control. We're now talking about brain input to control these devices. A brain-computer interface has just a few components. One, where we're actually recording, gathering those signals from your brain. And you see that electrical activity being captured, in this case from an electrocap. That information is being fed through wires and filtered into a form that our computers can understand. Now, before we get to a point of making use of that, we have to turn up the amplitude. Because imagine, your brain waves are going through layers of tissue, bone, fluid, to reach the surface so that we can hear it. Well, once we do that, we can harness that through some interface or device that we can now control. Here is a, a little bit of a crash course to help you fully appreciate the capabilities of your brains. And we'll walk around in similar fashion to our control center. So let's start on the left side of the brain. First, we have our language production area. This is our communication center that is located on the left side here. Now, for most people in the room, it is, in fact, on the left side. This is called Broca's area. If we continue around our brains and go to the, the frontal part, then we're at our flight director. This is our executive function. So responsible for judgment, complex mathematical functions, higher levels of emotion, and Sometimes our flight director shows up a little underprepared for the job. Now, if we keep going around, we get to this motor cortex area of the brain. So we're able to monitor movement, think about movement, or actually move. And we have the same fluctuations in that area of the brain. So 
Think about that. The same thought of actually moving versus just thinking about moving creates the same activity. Keep going around to the latter part of the brain. Now it's parietal, spatial orientation. And then finally in the back, occipital. This is uh, quite literally a reflection of a, a visual center. So if you see something flashing at a certain rate, we will see it flashing at that exact same rate in the back of our heads. So you start to imagine ways that we can plug in a sensor and make use of these different paradigms, these different thoughts for controlling things. We can use this for diagnosis as well. A, a neat thing that's happening now in pediatrics with this occipital region, where a baby can't tell you if they can see something or not, you can put a simple electrode, a little bit of paste on the back, flash something, and see if that flashing is reflected in their brains. We can also put an electrode on the surface of the scalp and get this information. That's one way. Or we can literally drill open your head and stick an electrode right on your brain to do it the other way. Unfortunately, I am not a neurosurgeon. And so within the business school, you can imagine not a lot of people are signing up for brain surgery. So instead, we do surface electrodes. And in this case, we're recording that electrical activity, also known as EEG, using these fun electrode caps. It's a little bit of gel that's going onto your scalp, connecting to the electrodes, and feeding into the computer. So yes, be forewarned, it might be a bad hair day, but still, there's some really powerful information that we can get from this recording technique. Another thing that we can use that is a little less invasive is functional near infrared. So just think your remote control for your television is shining into your brain and reflecting back how much oxygenated blood is present in that area of the brain. We need blood to these different areas to fuel our thoughts. So if I mentioned that language production area at the beginning, if you think about a word, no matter what your native language is, you have a rush of blood to that area, fueling that thought, versus just some nonsensical sound, we don't need that blood there. So now you can control that at will. Other things that we can monitor think, meet the parents. We're putting electrodes onto your fingers or some other sweaty area of the body and seeing how much sweat you're generating, your excitement or relaxation levels. Now, I would be sending things off the chart right now. <laughs> but this is something that, again, you can learn to control. Other ways that we can tap into your thoughts, your eyes, a reflection of your arousal or engagement levels, where are you looking, your pupil dilation. And so this is an example of a mobile eye tracking device that we can strap onto your hip and send you out into the field. Well, I already mentioned that I'm not a neurosurgeon. And so instead, I am closer to a computer geek with good ideas and good social skills, I hope. And I started this geekdom journey in, you can imagine, a geek high school. So I attended a magnet school, one of the top in the nation consistently, Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology in Alexandria, Virginia. There I saw this link between design and art. Well, I later had that nurtured through Randy Pausch of last lecture fame. And quite unfortunately, we lost Professor Pausch due to pancreatic cancer as well. But there, this link between design and why are we able to push or pull a door, not because of our own intelligence levels, but because of how it's designed and what it signals to us. And lastly, apprentice to this fantastic woman, Dr. Melody Moore Jackson. And that is where I learned about this area of brain-computer interfacing, a specialized form of human-computer interaction. Over the last 10 years, I've been helping fathers, aunts, friends, learn how they can harness the power of their brain to control devices. And most recently, met this gentleman in the middle here. Let's call him Jay. 20-year-old who is living locked in due to cerebral palsy. 
So you can get there a couple of different ways. It might be Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS, stroke, an unfortunate accident. In this case, his form of CP has rendered him completely unable to control his body. He can move his eyes, but he still wants independence. He has a girlfriend. He plays assisted flag football, and he wants to make Facebook posts without his mom. So that's what we're trying to do. And this is an example of what you can do in a very simplistic form of control. And in this case, my star performer, Provost Ken Harmon at Kennesaw State University, is using his thoughts to control the cursor on the screen. In this case, he is thinking open and close his hands to hit the target at the top, but he is not actually opening and closing his hands. To hit the target at the bottom, he is being rested and in a relaxed state. And he's actually pretty good. Now, we can control games. You might recognize Pac-Man or even World of Warcraft. We can control cars. There are unmanned or womaned vehicles on the road now, even being licensed in some states. You can control prosthetics, robotics, and even aerial vehicles. And in fact, sometimes you find yourself in a state of being locked in. In the case of a pilot who is pinned by certain forces, but their brains are still active and needing to attend to the series of controls. Well, not only can we control things, but that same technology can be used to understand what are you thinking? In this case, we see an example of a difference between novices and experts in the field, in this case of sales, where we know, we see this kind of played out in terms of experience, but the actual activity is different in the brain as well. So on the top is our novices, and what you see is this incredible cognitive processing that's happening. That red heat sink in the middle there is this cognitive load, so they're thinking very hard about things. On the bottom is our expert who is listening, if you remember that brain map from the beginning, the left side being activated and you see some neural efficiency, so the center not lighting up as much. So it's fascinating if we just listen to the right places what we can find out. Well, more recently, we're trying to control Google Glass. And if you're not familiar with Glass, it is a, a heads-up display, basically to allow you to see your cell phone right in front of you, projected out ahead of you. And I'm also even recording myself as we go along. Well, with Google Glass, like a helicopter pilot, you can see this information in front of you. It's controlled with your voice or touch. But now, as of the last two weeks, we are able to control it with your thoughts. So we have a working prototype out of the Kennesaw State University Brain Lab that is taking a paradigm that we uh, allude to as the AHA response, this P300, that is this response to whatever's presented when you're attending to it, if it is flash, if it's activated, about 300 milliseconds later, you'll have a response to it. So in this case, you focus on the X. When that lights up, 300 milliseconds later, that's the letter we know you want to select. So we can overlay anything onto this, not just letters, characters. It could be menu options. It could be icons. So you see the power in the interface here. Well, we're all very different very personalized brains, and we have to approach this in a very personalized fashion. For individuals who are using this technology, we don't have a lot of time to play around, although very cool. If we're saying someone who is locked into to ALS, it's about three to five years, their diagnosis before they pass away. So, with that comment, I return to the original phrase. Houston, we've had a problem. And I like that version because it's the past tense, implying although this technology is really neat, perhaps it will soon be unnecessary. And then I can focus on other endeavors, such as training up my little scientist on Google Glass. This is. Uh, a video of my daughter saying for the first time, the Google Glass. Google Glass. Okay, yeah. Record a video. And these are Google Glasses. Did you see? No, 
No, no. Google glasses. No, 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 okay. That's right. Google. Google. Glasses. Google. Glasses. Google. Google glasses. Google. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you.